you know, I'm not going to be somebody who says, oh, you know, Instagram's terrible. Instagram's the awful. No, but the thing is that a lot of the time that we spend on any social media usually comes out of the friendship budget. Welcome to The Fi Show, where you'll get a behind-the-scenes look into financial independence. Here's your host, Cody and Justin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Fi Show, where today we have on Eric Barker, author of Plays Well with Others. We talk about relationships and tons of different strategies, but before we get into all that, let me check in with my co-host, Justin. What is going on, man? Well, Cody, finally just got back to the States after a crazy week of traveling. For those who haven't heard, I've been in the Middle East. I've been out in Saudi Arabia, flew through Dubai, got to see some of the city as I was flying in, which is kind of cool to just get to see like the tallest building on the planet. And then also while I was out in Saudi Arabia, we went over to Bahrain, which was kind of cool. I mean, the reason most people go to Bahrain is because you got the ocean there. Like if you're in Saudi, you got the ocean there. And the other thing is like in Saudi, there is, there's no alcohol, like it's not legal to have alcohol. So there's no such thing as like bars or, you know, kind of that part of nightlife, although people do stay out super late. So it's kind of interesting, the cultural differences. I mean, people are out till two, three o'clock in the morning, but they're in like a a shopping mall or or just like maybe a hookah lounge because there's no alcohol in Saudi. But it was a great trip. We did this thing called Edge of the World, which is like this big Grand Canyon thing. And we had this driver who was like, on the side he's like this crazy like adventure driver so he's taking our tahoe and just run it through this thing like it's a rally car race we had some camel we saw some camels we did all the dunes we did a lot of hookah stuff we did some traditional stuff like i'd mentioned last week where we we dressed up in the thobes and celebrated eid and um so i think it was like a really cool mix of you know just getting to hang out do some things you might do in normal cities but also get to check out a lot of the kind of cultural parts in the nature so it was a great trip overall, and I would I, I couldn't recommend going to somewhere like Saudi enough. Like it was it was an awesome place and a place I'd never really thought I would be traveling to. Well, like I said last week, Justin, I have now added Saudi and just that part of the world to my list, so I'll have to make a trip out of it. I am having a great time on my trip. I am currently recording this from Lisbon, Portugal, which is where I was last week. But between last week's episode and this week's episode, we went to this kind of historical town called Sintra. There's a bunch of castles and it's just like really old. Most of it was built in the, I think, 17th century and they don't allow new construction. So if you want to like rehab a place, you have to use original material. So it's like these really niche builders that come in and like, you know, they're going to, they use the same type of concrete, the same type of paint, the same type of wood framing. It's really, really cool and interesting. So we spent a couple of days there and then we went to the kind of the richy rich beach town, which is called Kajkaj. It's where the president hangs out and it's where all the rich tourists hang out. But we actually found a pretty cheap Airbnb, so it was super fun. It's right on the water. Like Lauren and I were going on jogs in the morning just by the ocean side. A lot of amazing restaurants and just super cool culture. And we got to, you know, go to this thing called Fado Music, which is basically you're sitting in a bar or restaurant and there's no acoustics whatsoever. There's no amp. There's no anything to make the singing and playing louder. But someone is singing in traditional Portuguese. And then they usually have, I don't even know what instrument. It's kind of like a guitar, but it kind of looks like a ukulele. I honestly couldn't tell you what (laughs) instrument they're using. But that was really cool. It's just, it's been awesome. Honestly, the the food has been a huge highlight for me. It's been amazing. Seafood is so fresh in Portugal because the whole thing is basically a peninsula. And then the people have been really nice too. You know, sometimes you hear that Americans aren't so well liked. And I'm sure, Justin, you can attest to this. You said you were welcomed with open arms, which is just, it's, it's awesome. And, However people think Americans might be treated overseas, it's probably a lot warmer than you might expect. We have gotten nothing but just the nicest people, even if there's a language barrier, even if they don't speak any English and we don't speak much Portuguese, we're doing the Google Translate stuff, like they're giving us their traditional dishes, they're being super nice, and we've just been so gracious. So it's been an amazing trip so far. We're heading to Porto tomorrow. We're going to be there for a few days, and then we're going to hit France and Italy. But yeah, Portugal has been amazing so far. Yeah, one last little antidote on the like just being welcoming. One of the other things we did is uh, my friend Albara, he introduced us to one of his friends who had started this restaurant. And it's like a barbecue restaurant, like, like a Texas, like they have brisket and all this stuff. And he was so excited for us to come and try it and give him feedback as far as like what we thought about it as Americans. And the whole time I was there, anything we did with anyone else, like no one would let you pay for it. And they're so sneaky about it. They're like, you haven't even seen a waiter come talk to anybody and they've already just like have somehow magically paid for the check. So I think in Saudi, 
the way it was explained to me is like the first three days, it's like no questions asked. People pay for like everything. And then after three days, it's like they start kind of asking like, okay, so like how long are you going to be here? <laughs> All right, Justin. Well, that's enough of our travels. Let's take a quick moment to tell our audience about the awesome spreadsheet freebie that you're giving out. Yeah, Cody, I'm excited to make this available to all the listeners. It's the spreadsheet that I use personally from the time I started in 2015 when I had 38K to track. And now I've got this spreadsheet that shows everything I've spent all the way up to today. We're busted over that million mark. And so it's a tool that I found kind of stood the test of time. It's got all the categories in there for you. And I think it's just a really simple tool that's worked really well for me. And I hope it works well for the listeners. All right, Justin, I can't let you get away with not hyping yourself up enough because I've seen this spreadsheet and it is just all encompassing. It tracks all of your expenses. It tracks your net worth month to month. It tracks your income. It has kind of a ledger of all of your different accounts, whether that's bank accounts, 401ks, IRAs, anywhere where your money is sitting, Justin has a place for it. And so basically what Justin did was he took his spreadsheet that he uses himself, he made a template version for all of you guys to use, and he went ahead and recorded a video to show you exactly how he uses it month to month to track his net worth, income, and expenses. You can grab all of that for free at thefyshow.com slash spreadsheet. That's thefyshow.com slash spreadsheet. So today on The Fi Show, we have Eric Barker, author of Plays Well with Others, and Justin and I really get to grill him about all things relationships. This isn't just romantic relationships, this is work relationships, this is relationships with any person in your life, and how you can kind of optimize those relationships, how you can build the most genuine, the longest lasting, the most beneficial, like we just really get into every little piece of relationship building, and it's kind of fun to talk to Eric because he breaks it down as, as a science, whereas, you know lay people like Justin and myself, we maybe haven't broken it down to the micro levels that Eric is talking about. So super interesting episode. Definitely listen to the end and get all the tidbits that Eric shares about relationship building. Yeah, to echo what you said, Cody, it's that scientific approach, that analytical approach that I love about Eric's writing and also the fact that he's taking these things that a lot of times we just assume is true or things we've heard a million times and he just challenges those and really digs in to see like, is that really true? And he backs it up with science, like you said. And as always, we have those show notes out there where you can go find like the links to Eric's books or take that and share it with your friends. You can do that at thefyshow.com slash Barker. That's thefyshow.com slash B-A-R-K-E-R. Take it away, Eric. I was always keen on being a writer, basically from high school. And I knew that would mean self-employment. I knew that would mean basically kind of doing my own thing, like, you know, not having a boss and I majored in philosophy in college, and that was good in a way because it didn't give me any other options. So <laughs> I then moved to Hollywood as a screenwriter for, for 10 years, and then that was a lot of fun. But in the end, like I said, I really wanted to be working for myself. I started this blog. It took off. I had gotten interested in social science, so the philosophy thing tied back in. And then once the blog took off, I really started looking at kind of the world of online businesses. My first book came out. And now May 10th, my second book, Plays Well With Others, is is coming out. And this is it's been an exciting journey. So you knew that you wanted to be a writer from a young age. But one thing, I guess, because I've just never really talked to too many people who knew they wanted to be a writer. We've had a lot of people who ended up writing a book just because of the specialty they had. But knowing that you wanted to be a writer, did you know what kind of writer you wanted to be? Because I could, I could see like maybe having the seed where like you felt like you wanted to write something, but knowing do I want to do nonfiction, fiction, biographies, like, like what did you think you wanted to write growing up? It's a good point because I definitely wanted to be a writer. And at first, you know, I was really keen on fiction. I just was writing like stories and all kinds of stuff in high school. And then Hollywood, I wrote for Disney, I wrote for 20th Century Fox. That was all fiction. I started out writing action movies, then I ended up writing animated movies. And then I ended up in the video game industry. Then I went from that to blogging and blogging took me down the road of social science and research. And basically blogging, it's kind of its own thing, but there's, there's, you know, definitely a nonfiction aspect to it. And then with books, you know, books are a whole nother medium. So what's funny is like each time I had to completely relearn. And I think that's something that is gets to the crux of like entrepreneurship you know, is always having to be learning, always having to be adapting. And I just found that, you know, time and time again, I was always having to kind of shift, relearn, and was stressful. But now it's really nice to have seen all of those different worlds, because from both a writing perspective, a craft perspective, but also from a business perspective, 
it's a different lens with which to look at, you know, the world, to understand things. You have to have a lot more tools in your toolbox to do each one. So now that I'm here and I've been through a lot of these things, I'm, uh, I'm subsequently glad I did it, although I don't know if I would have volunteered for it initially. So since you started just putting your content out into the world on the internet, one, have you always kept the same brand name? And two, why do Japanese people think you're such an idiot? <laughs> Japanese people think I'm such an idiot because that, that literally is my name. So like I took Japanese as my language in, in college and I found out the first day that uh, Barker becomes Baka and Baka means moron. Uh, so and not only that, in Japanese, the sentence structure isn't typically my name is. The sentence structure is I am. So Watashi wa Baka des means I am Barker. Watashi wa Baka des means I am an idiot. They're the exact same sentence. So I've never had a Japanese person forget my name. And when I was working in Japan, I'm sorry, I was working in video games. I went to Japan many times and the rest of the team would always have to reintroduce themselves because it had been six months or a year since they'd been out. I never had to reintroduce myself. Oh, everybody always remembered Mr. Idiot. <laughs> so no, that was something memorable to me. Perhaps not the best choice in terms of a URL. I acknowledge that. Uh, definitely distinctive, but uh, I can always count on Google for people just putting in Eric Barker to, to bring up my blog otherwise. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I have no idea what that says, how to pronounce it, where that came from. It just looked like a strange conglomeration of letters. You know, one thing I think is interesting about you, especially because a lot of the guests that we have on, you know, a lot of the guests that we have on go down a traditional career path and they start figuring out what their passions are and they take a leap of faith to go chase it. But it sounds like you kind of just came out of the gate taking this leap of faith. I mean, I feel like anybody who moves to Hollywood, whether you're going to be an actor, screenwriter, any of that kind of stuff, you don't just like show up and you're a star. Like you're, you're, you show up and have good work. Like it's, there's probably a long slog. What was that like to take that leap of faith? And, you know, like what were those first years like when you were really cutting your teeth? I mean, that's the funny thing is in retrospect now, I can look back and be like, that's crazy. What the heck were you thinking? Like, you know, it's like, that's the, and at the time it was just like, it was the most obvious thing. It was just like, yeah, I want to do So that's what I'm going to do. You know, I, I want X, so I'm going to go get X, the end. And like, it, it just didn't even, you know, occur to me. But I can look back now and, you know, like my, my friends are starting to have kids and stuff. And I can definitely say like, oh, my God, they'd be nuts to do something like that. And I'm like, wait, I did that. And it's really a shift. But that said, like, I did get pretty lucky pretty fast. Like, I moved out within one year. I had an agent within in two years. I sold a script within three years. I had two movies made. You know, and like, so it, it, believe me, like I would have, after a few years, I probably would have been like, what the heck am I doing? If, if nothing would have happened, but like things did happen, but definitely looking back now, I'm like, holy crap. It's like, you know, it's, it's like, I don't know. It was like the career version of an episode of Jackass where you're like, why would you do that? But it was definitely fun. It was definitely cool. And then in the end it worked out. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I can imagine that your blog had kind of the same growth path, the same trajectory. No one who starts a blog all of a sudden has thousands of people reading like the next day after that first post goes up. I think it was 2009, if I'm remembering correctly, when I saw that first blog post. How long did it take to actually get traction and you realize you actually had something worthwhile that people wanted to read? You're absolutely right. Very similar trajectory, whereas I started it in summer 2009 and within a few months, I had a decent following because Tyler Cowan of Marginal Revolution was really supportive and he was very kind and he started just routinely sharing, you know, my stuff and he had a big platform and still does and he started sharing it and then all of a sudden, you know, by 2010, like Business Insider was starting to syndicate my stuff and then The Week started syndicating my stuff and Time Magazine started syndicating my stuff and then eventually, before I wrote my first book, I think I had like 150,000 email subscribers. And, you know, now it's, you know, well over 300,000. It was one of those things where, yeah, like I got positive reinforcement pretty quickly. I tried to do the right things, I guess, like back of the envelope style. I don't even know how to code, but I kind of just did what looked to be the fundamental right things. I focused on email subscriptions as my main way of connecting with my audience, which turned out to be a very good idea. 
beyond that, honestly, I really just focused on the content. And if you look at the design of my website, you can tell that I focus on the content because I'm certainly not focusing on aesthetics. <laughs> Well, we've kind of jumped from your Hollywood career to the blog, but I'm kind of curious on the transition because, and I don't know if there's some of the stuff that you worked on that you can kind of tell the audience, but if you're getting movies picked up, you're having an agent, like you're, you're having some success, what drove you to think, this isn't enough, this isn't really what I want to do, I'm, I'm going to step away from this, I'm going to make a, a big pivot. There was a lot of stuff in between the two, you know, Hollywood was like a decade and the thing about Hollywood is I was kind of stuck in this like weird middle, middle ground that it's this weird, strange middle ground purgatory that most people don't find themselves in. Like basically 99% of people, nothing happens. 0.9% of people make tens of millions of dollars and win Oscars. And then 0.1% of people <laughs> is, it was me. It was like stuck in the middle where I kept working, but like it never really kind of broke through the way I would have liked to. And eventually you're kind of like, okay, this isn't moving into the next gear. So I started looking at other things because it's tough when you don't get a clear signal. You know, you win an Oscar, that's a clear signal. Don't, don't, do not stop doing this. You are doing very well. And if you can't sell a script to save your life, you know, get out of there, clear signal. It's problematic when it's like you're selling stuff and making stuff just enough to kind of keep you on the hook, but it's not moving into the next gear. After some years of that, you're like, okay, which one is it? That's when I made the shift to the video game industry. And so speaking of pivots, you're writing this blog for at least a couple of years. And then you decide you want to kind of pursue a book, which is just a totally different beast, you know, than a couple thousand word blog post. Now you're writing a 10, 100,000 word plus book. What was the genesis of that first book? And I guess we don't have to go into that too, too much. Just want to paint the full picture of your background. We definitely want to focus on the newer book plays well with others. But where did Barking Up the Wrong Tree come from and what was it all about? I mean, basically, it was like the blog was drips and drabs of information. It started out as, you know, largely just me putting down interesting summaries of scientific research that kind of gave insight. The time of this shift, you know, like these shifts, like I was having questions about like, okay, what the heck am I doing in my life? What's next? And I wanted real answers. So I started looking at all this social science research which surprisingly had a lot of answers, a lot of questions that we all wonder about. And it's like, no, people are doing research on happiness, on success, you know, on all of the, the traits that make people successful and accomplished, the things that bring meaning in life. And I was like, wow, it's really interesting. But like dribs and drabs, like that's not a plant. That's not a map. And a lot of people have been encouraging me. You know, it's like, hey, you, you got to take the next step here. You got to like really do something. And readers had been, you know, asking me, it's like, when are you going to do something more and so it seemed like a natural next step. It was interesting to me because, again, it was like type of writing I hadn't done. Of course, I had to basically teach myself like, all right, how I know how to write a screenplay. But, you know, in, in these in these nonfiction books, you're not allowed to make stuff up. That's kind of a big shift. You have to get out of that habit real fast. And I basically said, like, OK, what's something cohesive like or more cohesive that I could put together as a package? And looking at all this research, you know, I I'd kind of become known for finding stuff that was counterintuitive, finding stuff that was the exception to the rule, finding like the myths that we kind of grew up with. And so that's what I put together was, you know, Barking Up the Wrong Tree, the book was basically about all the maxims of success, you know, that we all grow up hearing, like nice guys finish last. It's not what you know, it's who you know, you know, all of these kind of things. And I was like, you know what, let's, let's play Mythbusters here. Like, let's take these maxims that we, many of us hold as truisms and let's let's put them to the test scientifically. And so that's what I did. Each chapter was one of those maxims. Like I said, I kind of teach myself how to write a book. I told stories, weaved in the research, gave people the answers and worked out. It was Wall Street Journal bestseller. So the thing here is that if you write a book that's focused on success and it's not successful, you know, that's kind of almost <laughs> like proof you don't know what you're talking that's about. So like I am glad it worked out because I think I would have looked very silly otherwise. You just mentioned like, you know, the, the truisms, the maxism was there, whatever. And like you mentioned one specifically, which was whether nice guys finish last. And I, I saw the little blurb 
like a little deeper blurb from the book where it mentioned whether nice guys finish last and why the best lessons about cooperation come from gang members, pirates, and serial killers. That's an interesting tag, and I know that obviously this podcast can't cover an entire book, definitely not both books, but that one little line there, I'm just kind of curious if you could give us a little insight into kind of the type of writing that you're doing and the mentality you're taking, like the angles you're using with an example like that. I mean, basically it's like, you know, given my, my disposition and the fact that my background isn't having a PhD in psychology, my background was kind of Hollywood, you know, I'm always looking to make stuff entertaining, to make it accessible. It's like, if people wanted to just read kind of like dry research, they can do that. It's out there. People don't, they want the answers. So I try and distill it. I try and translate it, you know, into an entertaining, accessible way where people can use it. That's kind of where I see my role. So I try and tell stories, use analogies, you know, and talk about these kind of things. So for that example, what's really interesting is, you know, do nice guys finish last? And a lot of the research, most of it done by Adam Grant at Wharton, shows that the truth is the results are bimodal. In other words, the nice guys are found at the very bottom and the very top of success metrics. So it's really interesting in the sense of it's true, And it's also not true. So what it becomes is an issue of if you do the things to protect yourself from being exploited, from spending too much time helping others and making sure to take care of yourself, then being a quote unquote nice guy is actually one of the paths to the the very top of success. You just have to make sure to not be exploited, to not devote 110% of your time selflessly to others, to find a balance. But if you do that, then nice guys actually finish first. But to me, I thought, hey, what's the best way to look into this? And I found in history and in research that, you know, if you look at organized crime, if you look at pirates, you actually find like similar, you know, examples of this because what's really interesting is, okay, organized crime, pirates, like these are quote unquote bad guys. These are criminals. Okay, but they're running an organization. So that means you have to follow rules, right? Because otherwise it wouldn't be an organization. So it's really interesting to look for me at the examples of what are the rules that even the rule breakers follow? You know, when when you're finding a criminal organization, what happens? Like some of the really interesting insights, like in terms of organized crime, people think, oh, that must be so much easier because if somebody gets in your way, you can just kill them. And it's like, well, actually not really. Technically you can, but think about it for two seconds. If you're a mafia boss and everybody who makes you angry, you immediately shoot them. How many people do you think are going to want to work for you? (laughs) You So it becomes not a moral challenge, but more like a logistical challenge of you have to actually be careful. You actually have to have rules because if you go overboard in that way, yeah, you're going to be scary. Yeah, people are going to be scared, but people are going to want to work with you. So to look organizationally, how does this work? And to me, I found that a lot of that stuff actually aligned with a lot of that research on how do you balance being nice? How do you balance being assertive? How do you balance helping others with helping yourself? So that's what I try to do in in both the books was find colorful, illustrative, you know, viscerally interesting ways to get across the points from the very legitimate research. So speaking of nice guys, I got to go out on a limb here and defend my man, Dale Carnegie. Because you're telling me, I love the book, How to, Fre- How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> and you're telling me he's wrong. I, I got to hear the explanation here, Eric. Well, the truth is, for the majority, what he says, he's right. Dale Carnegie, it's like that book is almost a century old. And in the intervening years, social science proved the vast majority of what he said was largely accurate. You know, of finding similarity with people, paying sincere compliments, listening actively. All of these things have been validated by research, except for one, which was, he said, put yourself in the other person's shoes, see things through their eyes. And plenty of research, most specifically by Nicholas Epley, who's at University of Chicago, has shown we are actually terrible at this. We are terrible at when 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 meeting a stranger, we accurately perceive their thoughts and feelings about 20 percent of the time with friends that only hits 30%. With spouses, it only hits 35%. So whatever you think your spouse or partner is thinking, two thirds of the time you're wrong. So the majority of what Carnegie said is accurate. But the, the bigger concern that I express in the book is that Carnegie's, Carnegie's stuff is most helpful at the beginning of relationships. He tells you how to like 
when you first meet somebody to connect with them. And like I said, it's helpful, but it doesn't help to help you make deep friendships, the friendships that go on for decades. That's really not there. For Carnegie, it was very much a tool of influence, more of a business tool than making like brother from another mother, sister from another mister type deep friends. And that's more the issue I raise is how do we get to those deeper friendships? And I definitely don't want to just sink into the first book for the whole episode, but there was one that I thought was like super relevant to our podcast, right? It's a financial podcast. And a lot of times you think about people who look like they're going to be successful and then these other people surpass them or like, you know, they, they think they're going down this like traditional path and then someone who's entrepreneurial maybe comes around them. And this one says, why valedictorians rarely become millionaires and how your biggest weakness might actually be your greatest strength. I don't know if you kind of unravel that one a little bit, because to me, that one could maybe uh, resonate with, with our audience a lot. Today's episode is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. A VPN is a tool that improves your online privacy and protects you from hackers. Basically, it shields your IP address so anything you do online stays private, whether it's reading the news, streaming some shows, listening to podcasts, you name it. Plus, one of my favorite parts about VPNs is you can virtually travel around the world from the comfort of your own home, and Surfshark actually gives you over 100 countries to choose from. Once you change your virtual location, you'll be able to bypass censorship and restrictions and find your favorites on Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, or maybe you want to catch the next season of Peaky Blinders before it gets on HBO, like I did. Maybe you want to see a YouTube video that's location restricted. Use Surfshark VPN. Or maybe you want to access a specific deal in a specific country on a specific website. Use Surfshark VPN. Try Surfshark VPN by going to surfshark.deals slash fyshow and enter promo code fyshow to receive 83% off and an extra three months free. Again, that's surfshark.deals slash fyshow where you can try Surfshark's VPN risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. I think you're absolutely right. That's the first chapter of the book. And basically, it's getting into the issue of playing by the rules. And that specific study showed that valedictorians do very well. They accomplish more like they go to college. They're more likely to make six figures. But they are not typically, almost never, the people who go on to become billionaires, to become the heads of company, heads of state. They don't do the biggest things typically. You know, at first, people are usually very surprised by that. But the thing is that school usually rewards compliance. SAT scores and standardized tests are, are, are actually pretty good measures of IQ. They're pretty good measures of just fundamentally how smart you are. Grades, however, are usually a much better measure of how good you, how conscientious you are. It correlates very well with conscientiousness scores. How good are you at playing by the rules, doing what you're told? showing up on time. And so people that become valedictorians are usually people who are very good at following the rules. The thing is, the people who usually reach the tippy tippy top, the top one or 2% of success metrics are usually people who go outside the system, who reinvent the system. You know, it's those are the people who go above and beyond. They usually break the rules and that requires. And then in the first chapter, I go through a lot of examples of just how often that's true. Is you, when you look at, you know, the I think it was the Forbes 400, or you see a disproportionate, you know, number of people who, you know, dropped out of college. What's funny is if you look at maybe the top 10 percent or so, you see very high, you know, college attendance rates, very high graduate degrees. But then when you go to the even higher levels, you see more people who dropped out of college, more people who didn't follow through. So it's this whole idea of kind of rule followers versus rule breakers. And it is something that I think is very relevant for entrepreneurs, because the thing is, when you're in school, you need to get A's in every subject to be valedictorian. You need to get an A in history, you need to get an A in language, you need to get an A in math. But the thing is, that's what school rewards. That's not what life rewards. Right? Life generally rewards you being an expert in one area. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you go to get a job at Google, they don't really care how well, you speak Spanish or how well you did in history. If you are fantastic at math and fantastic at coding, you are going to be very welcome at many of the top Silicon Valley companies. Yet that wouldn't show up on your high school or undergraduate transcript. So the people who say, I am awesome at this one thing, I love it, and I want to be the best at it. Getting great grades requires them to say, oop, I got to stop doing that thing I love to go get an A in Latin. And the people who end up saying, hey, screw it. I don't care. I love coding. I'm going to keep coding. 
they don't do it. They don't get the grades, but they end up being awesome at they love. And I think that's something that's very relevant for entrepreneurs. Well, thank goodness I was only a salutatorian. Dodged a bullet there. <laughs> Dude, you just did. You just you're like Neo dodging the bullet. <laughs> All right, so let's start to talk about Plays Well with Others, your latest book, and relationships. Because I honestly think, I mean, these two books interlink really well. I think relationships play a huge role in how successful someone is monetarily, just, you know, rich relationships. Like, there's just so much that goes into networking and having good relationships with people. So, obviously, a lot has changed. And I was totally messing before about the Dale Carnegie stuff. But obviously, a lot has changed since... <laughs> We're still going to fight about it. But obviously, a lot has changed, you know, 100 years ago. It's a lot different environment, meeting people, relationships, just the way we communicate. So on a real tactical level, how do you go about making new connections, making new relationships? And, you know, especially over the past few years of the pandemic, where we're living in a really digital world. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of the Carnegie stuff, I mean, if you are face to face, a lot of the in the beginning relationships, the Carnegie stuff works out pretty well. You know, it's just that really for us, we need to learn how to deepen relationships. And during the pandemic, that has been so hard. So many people have been dealing with loneliness. And what I what I found researching loneliness is some of the stuff that blew me away the most, you know, in the book, because John Cacioppo was the leading researcher on uh, he passed away. He's a leading researcher on loneliness. What he found is that people who feel lonely and people who don't feel lonely actually spend the same amount of time with others. And I, when I've told people that, they go, well, huh? And it's surprising. But then when you think about it for a second, you know, we've all felt lonely in a crowd. You can have people around you and still feel lonely. And that's because loneliness is a subjective experience. Loneliness is how you feel about your relationships. You know, and over, and like you said, the world has changed. You know, like before the 19th century, people, like, loneliness basically didn't exist, you know, in the sense that people felt connected to a community. They felt connected to a religion. They felt connected to their tribe. They felt connected to their nation. You know, we've become so individualistic, especially in the 21st century, that loneliness has just exploded because we don't feel that connection. And that's why even we can feel lonely in a crowd because we don't feel like we're a part of something in the same way people did 100 or especially 200 years ago. You know, and now, yeah, absolutely. We are seeing with social media, we're seeing what people, what's called parasocial relationships, where technology starts replacing face-to-face -face time. You know, I'm not going to be somebody who says, oh, you know, Instagram's terrible, Instagram's the awful. No, but the thing is that a lot of the time that we spend on any social media usually comes out of the friendship budget. So it's not that it's awful, but if you eat so many snacks that you never eat meals. Chocolate cake's not bad, but if you just eat that all the time, it's probably not a good idea. So it's replacing it. So we're having these parasocial relationships. That's what's really harming us. So in the book, I really get into what it takes to deepen friendships. And what that comes down to fundamentally is time and vulnerability. I can go down the road, uh, the road on that, but I, I, don't, I don't want this to turn into a lecture series. I'm a little curious about what I could imagine could be a little bit of, a, of an intersection of these two things because obviously social media has changed a lot about relationships and social media has been running rampant for whatever it's been a decade plus 15 years. But this whole work from home and this, this distributed work culture is a lot newer. I mean, the pandemic just put it into overdrive. As far as teams being successful, building relationships together and being productive as an organization when you're never actually around them. I don't know if that's anything you've covered in the book at all or, or something you have like an opinion on or any research you've studied, but I, I'm really I'm really curious to see how long this lasts, this kind of everyone works from home culture, or, or at least a lot more people do today than they did three years ago, and, and kind of the impacts it's going to have on businesses. It's really an issue because you know, there, there is an advantage to face-to-face -to -face time, but I think we can address some of that, you know, with one of the things I talk about in terms of deepening friendships, which is the issue of vulnerability. Because the thing is, the problem with Carnegie's stuff is that in terms of deepening friendships, they're all very easy things to do. That's why we like them. Most of Carnegie's stuff is pretty simple, but to trust someone, we need costly signals. We need signals that show that you're putting something on the line. And that's why time and vulnerability are critical. Time's costly because it's scarce. If I spend an hour a day with you, I can only do that for 24 people, period, the end. Thank you for calling. 
you know, like that's just it. So it's because it's scarce, it's valuable. It shows somebody's meaningful to you. But the thing is the research, Jeff Hall did most of the research on the amount of time it takes to make a good friend or a best friend. And it's like tens of hours, hundreds of hours for like a best friend. It's really hard to do. But what's really cool is Arthur Aaron, another researcher, found that he could make two people feel like they had been friends for decades in just 45 minutes. And what that took was people opening up, people being vulnerable, people expressing their fears, their weaknesses, you know, really getting in there and saying the stuff that's a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit scary. That's what the best friendships have in common. And I think we can leverage that to some degree in terms of, you know, work from home pandemic issues, where if we get to know our coworkers a little bit better, if it's not just these kind of very surface relationships, you know, taking time, but also opening up a little bit. These are the things that lead to that real strong friendship. Aristotle defined friendship as another self. And that's actually been validated by research. Literally, when we're close to someone, our brains have trouble distinguishing them from us. And the self-processing parts of the brain actually light up in an MRI when we hear a friend's name. We start to literally, in our brains, feel closer to them, like an overlap in the Venn diagram. So I think vulnerability, opening up a little bit, talking about how you feel, saying stuff that's a little bit scary, I think that's something that can really help bridge that gap a little bit while we're still doing work from home during the pandemic. And so I've seen you do some writing on social media. I know you just touched on it when you were talking there about how it can potentially be toxic, but I've also seen you talk about its benefits with relationships. So could you talk about how maybe we could use social media to our advantage rather than to our detriment when it comes to building meaningful relationships? Yeah, I'd say there are two points there that are really important. And number one is if you are leveraging social media to meet up face to face with people, then it is a unalloyed good. It is a positive thing. If you're on there and you're messaging a friend and then you say, hey, let's get dinner. Hey, let's get coffee. Then you are leveraging it as a tool to stay in face to face contact to where you can have a full on relationship. You know, that is something that's the thing we have to be careful about is using it as a substitute as a, you know, as basically, oh, I got my friend time because I was on Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook. You know, the second thing is, like I said, hopefully you're not losing sleep over social media. I doubt you are. Hopefully you're not, you know, losing work hours to social media. I doubt you are. But where do you lose hours if you spend a lot of time on social media from your socializing budget? So that's where we have to be tricky. We have to say, like, rather than spending hours on there, we need to make sure that it's not taking time away, that we're, it's not accidentally, not deliberately, accidentally becoming a substitute for relationships because it's very easy with parasocial relationships. You know, hey, it's great. I face to face. If I get bored, you know, I can't leave. But, you know, with Instagram, I could turn it off whenever I want. Like that, that that's the kind of feeling that starts to creep into us where it's very convenient. It's at our whims. If it gets boring, we can walk away. You know, it's like it doesn't have some of the negatives that personal relationships have and has some of the positives. And I think a lot of us are kind of like like settling for that. We just have to a use social media, you know, leverage it to meet up face to face. And number two, just make sure that social media isn't taking too much away from your buddy budget that you would be using to meet people face to face. I'm a big fan of looking at things from these kind of, you know, some people call it like an 80 20 mindset where it's like 20% of the things can make 80% of the impact. Is there something when you look at relationships that people have, just like in a, in a general sense, that is probably the most impact? Like the thing you see happening the most often that someone could change and could really see a large impact in the, in the relationships that they're building? Absolutely. I mean, one of the biggest points would be in romantic relationships. But my, my guess is this carries over to a greater or lesser extent to other relationships. But the leading researcher on marriage and love is John Gottman. And he has a lab that actually has like an apartment in it. And he will have like couples come and stay for the weekend and they can and live their life in the apartment for the week. And he can study like everything they do. So this guy is like the king of marriage and love research. He can study the heck out of everything people do. And what he has found that just blew me away 
was that just by listening to the first three minutes of a marital argument, he can predict what the ending of that argument will be with 96% accuracy. And basically what that means is if a conflict discussion starts harsh, it is going to end harsh, you know, and the beginning of the conversation being harsh didn't just predict an ending that was harsh. It was also predictive of divorce. So literally just by rather than starting with an accusation, immediately firing both barrels, you know, if we just calm down, take a breath, raise the issue without making an accusation, it can make a tremendous difference because if you raise it harshly, it's going to end harshly almost, almost a hundred percent of the time. True for married couples, probably true for other relationships as well. And that's the kind of thing. The other big thing in terms of romantic relationships was that 69%, he found 69% of ongoing marital issues never get resolved. Like those Big things, of, you know, says you didn't take the trash out, whatever ongoing issues you have, 69% of the time, it never gets resolved. A lot of people find that depressing. But the point is that in many relationships, especially marriage, it's more about how you regulate conflict than always trying to resolve it. Some stuff you're not going to resolve. That 69% was true for happy couples and it was true for unhappy couples. But when people feel like we have to resolve this, sometimes you're not going to. You just need to be a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more thoughtful around it, because sometimes it's not going to get resolved and you could be happy anyway instead of driving yourself crazy. So actually, just recently, I finished the five love languages by Gary Chapman, and that obviously focuses specifically on romantic relationships. But what I found interesting was, you know, the actual love languages that each person kind of needs to be catered to differently. So when you were doing your research and looking at relationships, you know, outside of romantic relationships, whether that's coworkers or friends. Were you noticing certain archetypes like this type of person needs to be treated differently or you need to approach them with different words or different actions to you know, make that a deeper friendship? I mean, you know, I tend to rely on like the much more scientific issues, you know, when it comes to personality. So usually it's the big, big five personality traits, you know, of the acronym is OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. You know, so there are definitely differences, you know, in terms of how people interpret things, how people respond, you know, and stuff. The really negative predictor, you know, is neuroticism. Neuroticism is like the whipping boy of the big five personality traits. Usually not a positive thing. What's funny is, you know, Tolstoy has that old quote that like all happy families, you know, are alike. All unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. And Gottman actually found it's the reverse, is that all couples typically make the same mistakes. Yes, there's certainly issues of people are different, but he found four things that are the most predictive of divorce consistently time and time again with every couple. And that was criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling and contempt. And those four things like were over 80 percent predictive of divorce. Criticism was basically complaining's OK, you know, in a, in a romantic relationship. Criticism is when you make it personal. Complaining is you didn't take out the trash. Criticism is you didn't take out the trash because you're an idiot. You know, it's like criticism is bad. Defensiveness is when somebody raises an issue and you immediately shoot back at them. You don't listen. Stonewalling is when somebody raises an issue and you just shut down and just don't even like engage. And contempt is the worst. Contempt is like horrible and destroys relationships. And that's when you think you're better than your partner and you make that clear. But that's what's interesting to me is that, sure, there are differences between people. But the real like four things that create a romantic relationships are eerily consistent between couples. I feel like a lot of times with these type of things, like not to give someone, uh, you know, anyone like an excuse, but it, a lot of times it feels like it's like these second nature type things. You know, you, you have these things you ha you struggle with, like you struggle to quickly assume things you struggle to and get defensive and it's not even like you're consciously thinking about it. like it just happens so for people who maybe have recognized like they're struggling with something like that and they want to work on it i don't know if there's anything you kind of talk about where it's tips on changing the way that you are in these aspects that's really interesting because the thing is gottman found that those four things produced led to divorce about 80 plus percent of the time well 80 percent is not 100 and what he found that was very interesting was the concept of repair, which is that you can have those negative things going on, but as long as you make an effort to 
prepare. As long as you make an effort to, during an argument with your partner, hold their hand, you know, make a joke, break it up. So it's not just relentless negativity. You know, those efforts to try and alleviate it, even if you have those problems, you can fix them. So yeah, it's like some of us, sometimes we just can't even control it. It's our personality. And the thing that we can learn in romantic relationships, but probably in all relationships, is that if you make an effort to ease off, make an effort to fix it, apologize, then relationships can be sustained. Was there anything when you were conducting your research, because you mentioned you're a really analytical guy, that like really surprised you that before you went out and did all this research on relationships that you would have never expected? The loneliness stuff, you know, certainly the harsh startup in terms of marital arguments. The other thing was like just how ter- like I mentioned how terrible we are at reading people. And along those lines, the things that really shocked me were so many people really love body language, like studying body language, books on body language. And the truth is we're horrible with body language. Like intuitively, we get an idea. But when we consciously focus on body language, like if somebody's shivering, we don't know if they're nervous. We don't know if they're cold. We can't read their mind. And the <laughs> funny thing is, and what's funny is we're doing a podcast here, is that the voice is actually far more telling and gives us far more information than body language. When you can hear someone, but you can't see them, empathic ap- accuracy only drops off about 4%. When you can see someone, but you can't hear them, empathic accuracy drops off 54%. Wow. So it's like the voice is going to tell you a lot more than whether or not they cross their legs or whether or not they scratch their face. Those things are really myths. And along similar lines, I've got a whole big section on lie detection. And another thing we got very wrong. Most people think that it's about, you know, signs of anxiety, signs of emotion. That's what the polygraph looks for. And that is not correlated with lying. What is correlated is what's called cognitive load, which is that lying actually takes a lot of brain power. And one of the best methods, like meta methods to smoke out a liar is to actually make it more cognitively taxing, make it more, a lot more work for them to tell a lie. And that's actually a much better method of lie detection than looking to see if they're nervous or sweating or anything like that. And when you say that, are you talking about like just getting really deep into the details, like asking like for them to elaborate on something or give like a, just a deeper detail on something that would cause them to get even more creative with the lie? I mean, that's part of it. One of the things they did that has really been shown to be effective, this was actually research that was done, you know, by the military for Guantanamo Bay interrogation and for police and for a lot of other stuff, because people's typical ability to detect lies is about 52%. Basically, it's a coin toss. And police officers generally, when surveyed, will say they're better at it and studies show they're not. One of the great ways to increase cognitive load and help, and help smoke out a liar is asking unanticipated questions. First and foremost, when you ask yourself, does it look like this person's lying? That's not the question you ask yourself. Ask yourself, does it look like this person has to think hard? Just by shifting from the first question to the second question, the police officer's ability to detect lies went up because now they're looking for the right signals. But like I said, one of the techniques is asking unanticipated questions. So, you know, if let's say I'm a bartender at a bar and you are underage and you walk in and I say, how old are you? Well, you're going to say 21. Okay. But what if I ask you, what year were you born? Now for you or me, that's very easy to answer. Honestly, for somebody who's lying about their age, now they have to do math and they're going to pause and it's going to be awkward. So that kind of thing, when people say, oh, oh yeah, no, no, I, I, I was at the meeting yesterday. Oh, okay. You're at the meeting yesterday. What was Carol wearing? <laughs> By asking questions. Now they could answer it, but they could answer it. But like I said, they're probably gonna have to pause. They're probably gonna have to think they've got to ask. And the other thing they have to think about is, is he going to call Carol? So asking unanticipated questions can be extremely powerful because People are only going to do so much work to support their lives. And the more research you do about the event in question, the better questions you can ask and the better you'll be able to ask unanticipated questions. The reason that one was interesting to me is because like, we had a family friend who like, my dad was always in law enforcement, and but he was someone who actually went out and, and taught some of the lessons to like the FBI and, and like 
they use some of his interrogations to kind of like teach them. And one thing, you know, everybody always is like wanting them to like, you know, like test me, test me, whatever. And he would like try to get a baseline on you. And it was something similar. He would ask you questions that you would have like really quick knee jerk, like knowledge of like your street address, all these things. And then he would ask you this question that you were definitely not anticipating, like a very intimate, embarrassing kind of question. You're like, oh, I don't And he would just like see the way like that you reacted to something that's just like a very nonchalant, like you just muscle memory question. And then like something that's like, oh, now you like, you either got to like really think about it. You're like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to say this. And then now he's kind of got, okay, now I understand like how you react to these two questions and I'll know like if I'm asking you something and you're just giving me that easy memory or you're giving me something that you're having to think harder about. That's really powerful because he was basically calibrating and it's to be able to say initially, because like I said, you're looking for signs of someone having to think hard. And what he did was initially kind of set both goalposts. He said, I'm going to ask questions where you don't have to think hard. Let me see how you react. Now I'm going to ask questions where I know you have to think hard. I'm going to see how you react. And now when he subsequently asks questions, he can ask himself, is it closer to point one or closer to point two? And that's really powerful because that is the kind of thing. That's why I said like body language, you can get better at reading body language, but you need a baseline. And that's exactly what he did. And that is a very powerful method. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it looks like we are at the end of our time here, Eric. And for those who want to follow along, for those who want to get access to the freshly minted book, where are the best places for them to do that? Plays well with others. It's out May 10th and it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all your major book retailers and my blog. We won't bother them with the Japanese URL. (laughs) We'll link it in the show notes. (laughs) They can go to ericbarker.org, E-R-I-C-B-A-R-K-E-R.org. And that will redirect them to the unpronounceable name of my blog. Awesome, Eric. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. These are like just some really interesting topics. They're all topics that regardless of what someone's interested in, they're all like running into in day-to-day life and could, uh, could use some knowledge on. Thank you very much. And as always, if you want to check out our Facebook group page, you can do so at thefyshow.com slash community. And we always appreciate those five-star reviews. They help us get great guests like we had today. And if you're interested in supporting The Fi Show, you can do so by checking out some of our partners over at the resources page, which can be found at thefyshow.com slash resources. And thanks for listening.